It's a pleasure and a privilege to speak to you at this TED conference. In a moment, I'll briefly review my past. I'll close by telling you how I presently live and how I hope to continue to live. And all this will be in the context of my age, which, as I think you all know, will be 95 next month. Now, I was born and lived the first 20 years of my life from May 1918 to August 1938 in New York City. In 1937, at the age of 19, I graduated from the City College of New York with a Bachelor of Science degree in Physics and Mathematics. In 1942, I received my Doctor of Philosophy degree in Theoretical Physics from the University of California in Berkeley. Now, my thesis advisor at Berkeley was J. Robert Oppenheimer of Los Alamos and the development of the nuclear bomb fame. I didn't go to Los Alamos or otherwise work <clears throat> on the nuclear bomb, however, as many of Oppenheimer's students did. Instead, I spent World War II doing anti-submarine warfare research. Now, as soon as possible after the war ended, I embarked on the academic career I had hoped for, since graduate school, actually, beginning in September 1946 with an assistant professorship at the University of Southern California Physics Department. In 1964, after a few other academic and industrial positions which needn't be detailed here, I accepted my last academic appointment as a full professor in the University of Pittsburgh, or Pitt Physics Department. Now in 1982, at age 64, I took early retirement from my Pitt professorship. But Pitt then immediately gave me the title of Emeritus Professor, thereby permitting me to retain an office, or at least a desk, in the Pitt Physics Department, and to otherwise be treated as if I were still a salary member of the department. And that's a privilege I've much appreciated and I'm happy to acknowledge here. Now, how I came to retire deserves amplification. Although I was quite happy with my professorship, I knew that I would have to retire at age 70. The present law, which bars universities from forcing the retirement solely on grounds of their age of otherwise able professors, didn't become effective until well after I had reached 70. Now, I was very healthy. I expected to stay healthy. I had every intention of remaining fully and usefully employed until long after 70. So in 1977, at the age of 59, I obtained a law degree and passed the bar exam, thereby entitling me to call myself an attorney, and which explains why I retired from Pitt when I did, thereby enabling me to accept a full-time appointment on the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania's Environmental Hearing Board, the EHB, where I ruled on often quite important environmental law disputes. Now, about six years later, my EHB appointment came to an end, and I accepted employment at a respected Pittsburgh law firm. I was not, however, and didn't want to be a partner in the firm. Rather, I acted in a so-called off-counsel capacity, which meant I served as a consultant to any partner who had a client with a problem involving environmental law, which was a legal subject which, because of my combined scientific background and EHB experience, I had really become quite uniquely qualified in. Anyway, I continued in that off-counsel capacity and was quite content to do so until my law firm broke up through no fault of mine. I was not a partner, remember. The breakup occurred in 2003 when I was 85 years old. I felt correctly, I'm sure, that I'd reached too old an age to look for and secure another off-counsel position in a congenial law firm. So I returned to Pitt and to full-time use of my physics department office facilities, and which actually I had used during every one of those legal employment years, on many weekdays and evenings and weekends, to continue my physics researches. And during those legal employment years, I also used my physics department office in fulfillment of my duties serving on a number of committees of the American Physical Society, or APS, which is the most important United States organization of professional physicists. 
<clears throat> I'd been engaged in such APS services since the early 1970s, as a matter of fact, which services had included serving on its Human Rights Committee and chairing it because human, protecting human rights is an endeavor which always has been dear to my heart. Now, when I returned to physics department in 2003, I decided not to continue the physics researches in which I had been engaged since my graduate student days. Instead, I decided that, despite my 85 years, I would venture into a very new field of theoretical physics called quantum computing information, abbreviated as QCQI. This research field, which had not even been imagined when I was learning quantum mechanics from Oppenheimer, holds promise of replacing our already very powerful so-called classical computers by even more powerful quantum computers. So at age 50, 85 and beyond, I couldn't possibly expect to make a splash in a new research field of this sort. But I could hope to make some worthwhile contributions, and indeed, somewhat to my own surprise, I have managed to publish in respective physics journals six papers in this new QCQI field, two of which were solely authored by me. Now, at this juncture, I suppose I should summarize my publications and related professional accomplishments. I've authored or co-authored more than 100 papers in highly respected physics journals. I also have published in similarly respected law journals more than 40 articles and book reviews on subjects related to the intersection of law and science. But during the years 1981-86, I also served as the editor-in-chief of the American Bar Association Jurometrics Journal of Law, Science, and Technology, and I've given numerous invited talks at both physics and legal conferences. Nevertheless, I must say, to avoid any possible misunderstanding, that my career, though certainly successful, highly respected even, cannot be termed spectacular. I haven't won any prizes or awards, not even minor ones, for my scientific or legal achievements. Nor have I been elected to the elite United States National Academy of Sciences. Which brings me to the present and to what I hope my future will be. In this connection, let me first say, I'm very frequently asked, as I imagine many of you in the audience want to ask me, to what do I attribute the facts that at the age of 85, 95 I mean, I still am able to function so comparatively well. I'm still walking without a cane, as you can see. I'm still living independently in my own apartment. I'm still able to prepare and give talks like this one. Well, my steadfast answer to this question the only correct answer, I'm sure, is that it's primarily pure good luck, although the way I've lived my life may be somewhat relevant. In particular, I never smoked, and also for many years, when I've had to go up and down a few flights of stairs, I've made a habit of walking them rather than taking the elevator. Nonetheless, it's surely pure luck, no credit to me, that I happen to have genes that didn't earn me cancer or diabetes or multiple sclerosis or Alzheimer's or any of the other myriad genetic diseases of old age. Accordingly, although I certainly have seen signs in me of steady aging, especially in the last few years, I intend to continue regularly using my pit office to work on QCQI research. And even if I'm not able to publish more papers in that field, as I have not been able to do in the past three years, I will continue doing so. And I know, I'm sure you'll all agree, that this intellectual activity keeps me cheerful and relatively young. Now, I also intend to continue a number of other activities in which I've long been engaged. Activities consist with my various deep beliefs and values. Activities which include as much financial support to those organizations I want to support as I reasonably can afford. And so, I intend to continue working with and financially supporting the American Civil Liberties Union, on whose Pittsburgh chapter board of directors I've served in the past, and which presently lists me as a member of its honorary board. Similarly, I want and plan to continue serving on the board of directors 
of the Pittsburgh-based Group Against Smog and Pollution, widely known as GASP, which for more than 40 years has unceasingly and successfully worked at reducing air pollution in the P Pittsburgh area. So in short, as long as I can, I intend to continue pretending that I'm not aging, even though I know I am. And so, consistent with this pretense, I truly hope to be again speaking to all of you 10 years from now. In the meantime, thank you for listening.